Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today for this Scottish Mortgage webinar. My name is Claire Shaw, and I'm an investment specialist on the Scottish Mortgage team. I'm delighted today to be joined for the first ever live event um, with not one, but all three managers of the Trust. So a very warm welcome to James Anderson, Lawrence Burns and Tom Slater. Moving on to the agenda for today, um, we're going to maybe spend the next 40 minutes or so um, posing the questions to James, Lawrence and Tom that many of you um, submitted in advance. So thank you um, to those that took the time to do that. We'll then leave the last um, 20 minutes or so of the webinar where you'll have the opportunity to have um, your questions answered live. So if you want to use the Q&A function in Zoom, we will endeavour to get through as many of them as time permits. So by means of an introduction, um, we have titled today's discussion, uh, Embracing the Extraordinary. Uh, the inspiration for, for this was uh, taken from a recent quote by the chairman of Moderna, a company that needs no introduction uh, after the last uh, 12 months. And he said that you have to be willing to embrace unreasonable propositions and unreasonable people in order to find, make those extraordinary findings. And I think this really struck a chord with the philosophy that sits at the heart of Scottish mortgage. So Lawrence, if you don't mind, I'm going to put you on the spot and, and come to you um, first on this. You've often said um, that in our quest to find these extraordinary companies, you know, you would much rather endure drawdowns and disappointments than abandon our backing for these great entrepreneurs and these great, great companies. So just how important has this mentality been in the context of the last 12 months where we have had this extreme volatility and, and uncertainty? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's critical and I think it's not just critical of the last 12 months, but at much longer periods that markets are volatile and companies progress is rarely a straight line, even for great companies. Um, and you know, if, if you look back at what's contributed to Scottish mortgages performance, um, you know, most of our best performing companies have all had drawdowns, maximum drawdowns of around 40%. Um, you know, Tesla was bought in 2013 for the trust. It's, uh, I think, experienced um, you know, over 10 drawdowns of 30%. So I think the first point is that just all companies and even great companies go through these periods. Um, and I think that shows the importance of sort of remaining with a long-term mindset and just continually being focused on what the five to 10 year possibilities are. And, and I think, you know, relaying it back to sort of the, um, looking to back extraordinary people and extraordinary companies, you know, I think the key thing we have to remember that the greatest cost to our shareholders is, is giving up on these extraordinary companies because they what offers the really huge returns and they're worth backing through these difficult periods. Now, they don't always work out, but the key point is that in market returns, this is just a very common feature that you'll have these difficult periods. Absolutely. And then maybe just picking up on, on something um, you said there, Lawrence, and, and James, maybe I'll pose this question to you. And it was something that um, one of our shareholders wrote in with, which was, when we're looking for these extraordinary um, founders, you know, you put a lot of significance on founder owners of businesses. But over the last 12 months, we have seen a number of these step back, you know, so Jeff Bezos of Amazon, Jack Ma, um, Alibaba, Zhang Yiming. So one of, our, one of the questions that we had in is, how has this really affected your thinking on, on these companies? Has, has it changed your engagement um, at all? I can give you a one word answer. Yes, <laughs> it, it, it has to. But Claire, I think it's very important that one shouldn't have a generic answer to it. If you look at the past record of companies, it's profoundly different about whether their success endures or not after the exit of the core founder, genius or whatever, Apple being an obvious example, where it seems to have endured quite a long period, longer than we would have suspected. But if you look at other companies in the same industry, such as Sony, where it didn't endure at all. And I think it also is dependent, if you like, on how the company has thought about this in advance. Now, as a couple of recent books have made very clear um, in extremely f fine descriptions. Yes, Bezos has been absolutely, absolutely crucial to most of the big decisions taken inside Amazon. I'm not sure, Tom, that we would imagine that they would have been taken without him. But equally, there is a very identifiable process and culture which will be left there as a style of doing. 
So, you know, in Amazon's case, in Amazon's language, I think Bezos no longer being there means that this isn't day one any longer, but it may not be day 10,000, uh, day two or three, and that makes a difference to how we think about it and the size of the holding we should have against that background. And in a sense, Alibaba is an even more extreme example because their philosophy, and I actually chatted to Josiah about this um, quite recently, but it was also one that Tom went with through them uh, when we first owned Alibaba before it's a public company, was that you couldn't expect the same person to be able to move through and that particularly in technology driven businesses, you should be prepared to have a different generation taking charge and their partnership structure um, enables them to move on. And, you know, I think we'll get them through this otherwise very uncomfortable period that, <laughs> the, the, if you like, the, the triggers for Jack Ma's uh, almost complete disappearance from the company. So, I, you know, I, absolutely, yes, it does make a difference to go back to the original conference, but we cannot have an absolute template for how it makes a difference. difference. Interesting. And then maybe just picking up on, I guess, extraordinary um, founders and, and Lawrence, you alluded to this at the beginning in, in terms of Tesla and just the you know, number of jawdowns it has. It's, it's probably safe to say that Tesla has undergone a bit of a 180 um, over the last year in terms of what was a once very hostile investment and media community um, are now sort of starting to realise, you know, the, the benefits that Tesla can actually uh, add to society. And Tom, we've had a number of questions um, that came in around the same theme, which was, Obviously now it's been widely reported that we've sold approximately 80% of our Tesla holdings. Um, but the question was really around, how did you reinvest those proceeds? And also where, where are you finding ideas um, around this sort of post-carbon um, economy that I know James and yourself have, have um, you know, talked about in the past? Yes, so we, we have um, sold a significant number of the shares in Tesla that we owned. Um, that's partly a function of ensuring appropriate diversity in the fund um, and and then with some of the the increases that we saw at the tail end of last year um, when uh, around the, the company entering the the s p 500 index and, and splitting its shares um, we, you know the, we, we come back to this discipline of asking how do we make five times our money from this starting point and how likely do we think that is mm -hmm. um, and and then that drove some further reductions um, and it's actually an unusual example for us because usually it's the purchases that, that drive the sales. It's where do we, yeah. where do we find um, the, the resources to fund the new idea? And it's that competition for capital, which, which is really a really important dynamic in the portfolio. Um, in this instance, the, the moves in Tesla share price had been so dramatic that it was, it was pushing us maybe to move a bit faster than that. Um, but the good news was that there, there were so many things that we wanted to add to through the course of last year. And what seems really interesting to me at the moment is just how um, widespread um, and, and rapid growth is. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you can see that in some of the large holdings, you know, companies like ASML or Illumina growing at 30%. You can see it in some of the Chinese companies, which where revenue growth is more like sixty percent at the moment, or you can you can see it in you know we've 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 mentioned um, Moderna, but maybe something like Zoom, some some of these companies that are driving the big changes that that we're seeing is or, or empowering this, the big changes we're seeing in society at the moment that are growing over a hundred percent. So there's this abundance of of growth. So it was not a, a particularly challenging uh, task actually to find to find companies that we wanted to reinvest those proceeds into. Okay, and then maybe just following on from that, James, I think you said maybe about this time last year that you proclaimed that this was the end of the, the, the carbon age. Um, and I think at, at that point, uh, one of our, our shareholders had mentioned that you you said that the opportunities that you saw was very much in the private um, the private sphere. You were struggling to find any opportunities um, you know, in the public market. So over the last year, we've obviously added Northvolt um, and, and Chargepoint. So it maybe just be worth elaborating on, on those two names um, for the, in the portfolio context. Yeah, and if, if I may, Claire, and you know this is how we, we go about things, perhaps a bit of a, a gloss and a conversation. I don't mean debate or disagreement with, with, with Tom about this. You know, I, I think we're way underestimating 
the sheer scale and the sheer beneficial scale of what is going on in the energy world. You know, we mused about this before and perhaps it was very early on, but I genuinely believe that the best way of thinking about it is to believe that energy will be as free as search on the internet or whatever other uh, aspect of the digital economy you want to talk about. And I think that is such a profound change from an accumulated set of philosophies that have grown up since the first oil crisis. Mm -hmm. And the impact of not having this perennial, the oil price going up, there's either going to be inflation or economic activity and productivity is going to go I think it's being way underestimated. And I think, you know, it's, you should go back to material <coughs> written in the 19th century when energy first seemed to be unlimited, non-damaging in that way. And the next reflection would be, I really don't know what are going to turn out to be the best eventual beneficiaries of this. And, you know, I think it's worth spending a, a minute or two of the audience's valuable time on this. So I think one of the most powerful statements Jeff Bezos ever met, made was, which is quite something, was when he said in the early days of Amazon, there's this weirdness about our business. Everything gets better and cheaper, usually by around 50% per annum. And then he paused and said, I don't know where that will take us, but I know it's going to be exciting. And I think that's the attitude of mind we need to have at this point, because there will be so many second round effects that we cannot imagine at this point, but it is incredibly exciting. And it's not simply, however important it is, a climate change mitigation. It is opening up a set of opportunities that simply didn't exist otherwise. Now, I think there is thereby a requirement to do some quite heavy build out. And actually, both the two companies, Northwell and Charge Point, you mentioned, are really involved in that, aren't they? It's the follow on investment. But I don't think these are commodity type businesses no. at all. Um, and in particular, I would point to a couple of ones on the Northfold ingredient, which are you know, very much on my mind. The first one is, why, in the name of God, or gods, whatever you prefer, is this not happening in Britain? Yeah. Uh, it was basically the idea of a Swedish venture capitalist who's now moved on to try and inculcate green steel, so another minor adaption to the world. Um, and for sure, he needed great help from an ex-Tesla executive, as we were chatting about before. But I think the whole aspect of there needing to be regional capacitors in these areas is, I think, the pattern that we're going to face. You know, there will not be global networks of suppliers and all likely to this. There will be local ones. And I think that's going to be very important in the whole build-out process. But please, it's just so exciting and it's so important for the next 10 years that it will go well beyond these two. Absolutely. And um, maybe just um, Lawrence coming, coming to you, I think Northfolk is probably a, a good example um, of how we're thinking about climate change and, and that sort of broader maybe ESG um, space. And, and I know that um, we're very much not of the, the mindset of, of ESG mantras and, and box ticking exercises. I know, James, we were talking a few weeks ago and you used the phrase about, you know, we're trying to you know, um, tilt the odds of success in, in, in the favour of our, of our companies. And Northfolk's probably a, a great example um, of that. You know, we want to make that actual difference. So maybe, Lawrence, I'll, I'll pose to you, you know, our approach to ESG, if you like, is, is quite different. And that has been picked up, you know, from, from our shareholders. So why is that the case, do you think? Why do you think our approach to governance and ESG is, is quite different to, to the masses today? I think there's probably two reasons. I think the first reason is I think we've always seen ESG as something not separate from investment, but very interlinked to trying to work out what are the future possible states for companies in on a five and 10 year time horizon and realizing that companies don't operate in a vacuum. They operate in symbiosis with society and their environment. And we need to understand those interactions and what they might mean for the future. I think the other way in which we probably think about it a bit differently as well within that is we're less interested in the past and more interested in the future. So it's, it's how companies can change the world that matters, not what they're doing at the moment. And I think the final thing I'd probably say is that 
I think we also want to be quite cognizant of not just focusing on the impacts of companies, but also the impacts of us as fund managers. And I think that goes to the point of how one can um, play a small role in sort of tilting the odds of success in favour, because companies need long term supportive shareholders that back them to do long term ambitious things, to take calculated risks and often need the provision of primary capital. And we have provided capital to firms that have gone on. I mean, Tesla would be one example that would be others to do things which I think are beneficial for society at points where they would have struggled or, or maybe found it more difficult to raise that capital. And I think that's a responsibility of the financial markets to make sure we're supporting companies to, to develop and, and improve our society in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. And I know, James, that's kind of what you alluded to, is that's probably what you're most proud of, you know, in terms of this context, you know, where we can make a real difference um, to these companies. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, of course, we're in no way claiming that Tesla's success is because of us. But it's somewhat shattering to remember that we were basically, for quite a long period of time, Claire, the only major institutional shareholder of Tesla in the world. The, the other couple of people had opted out. Um, and, you know, I think that it's really important that we manage to convey somehow in a much stronger method than we've, I've failed to do so, so far, that the number of companies that can make a real difference to the societal outcome is tiny. Yeah. It is, if you like, a subset of that very small number of companies can actually have an impact on returns. Yeah. Um, so it's a vanishingly small number, but we need to regard those with enormous respect, affection and protection. Absolutely. As you say, it's that willingness to be unpopular, isn't it? And trying to find these extraordinary yes, it is. companies. I mean, I, it's uncomfortable I, I hope times, it's I'm not sure. a, a, a coming up to retirement cheap shop. But, you know, the two companies that we've been questioned most on of the year are Tesla and Amazon. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'm not sure that that's turned out to be a great topic in the past. Indeed. Um, maybe just changing tact slightly. Um, Tom, a number of uh, shareholders commented <coughs> on and picked up on something you said in your manager's report. And it was in the context of what is very in vogue at the moment, which is SPACs or Special Purpose Acquisition Vehicles. And I think you mentioned that you were quite sceptical um, about our flying taxi companies, Joby and, and Lilium, about whether this was actually the right structure for them um, going forward. So we had a number of questions coming in, which was, why, in your opinion, do you think staying private would have been a more favourable path? And then probably more interesting as well is, whereabouts are these companies in terms of becoming commercially um, operational? Well, I'd tie this slightly to some of the earlier questions. Um, I, th I think you were asking about founder managers and their importance. And to, to my mind, the, the important thing about a, um, a founder manager, or it may go back one level, the, the thing that we're looking for in a company is, what is it that enables it to think really long term about the the issues it's trying to address and relentlessly pursue those opportunities to the exclusion of the noise and pressures that 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 will inevitably arise and founders of public companies have a special license i think to look through that pressure from wall street um, and and take decisions on a different time frame. Now that's that's not universally true, um, but but and and it doesn't have to be a founder. But it is often the case that having that founder founder manager presence allows companies to to think on a different time horizon. Now that's in public companies. If you, it, I think it is easier, or potentially easier for private companies because you don't have that breadth of external shareholders, you don't have the Wall Street analysts, you don't have the quarterly earnings um, regime. Um, now, it does though depend on who your shareholders are. Have you, have you got the right set of shareholders to back you in pursuing that long-term vision? Um, it, how much of your own destiny have you retained? And, and, and so when you look at what's been happening recently and the um, provision of uh, this, this, this aggressive pursuit of companies to, to move public through this SPAC structure. Um, the, the questions for me are, when you get to public markets, are you, are you ready for the environment you're going to find yourself in? You know, if, if, if your, your share price um, drops 50%, you know, what, what, are, what are you going to be talking about? How are you going to be explaining that, 
the business to people? You know, what are, what are the flaws under the, under the share price? And what is it that's going to stop the business crumbling in, in, in that environment? Yeah. And, and I think that equation is, is different for all companies. Um, and if you, 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 you talked about Joby and Lilium, the flying car companies, and, and the, the, the calculus for them, I think, is that getting to the point of launching um, these, these services commercially is expensive. You, know, you, you have to go through the Federal Aviation Authority's certification process. It's, it's rightly uh, a long, arduous, expensive thing to do. Um, and so what these, what these, what, as these companies have looked at the set of issues, they said, right, with, with a SPAC, with, with, a, with, a, um, with, with these, these, these fundraising structures, I can get a lot of money onto my balance sheet today. Yeah. Which I, and, and then they're saying that they're going to prioritize that and having that funding secured um, to, to get them through this next stage. Yeah. Um, what they're sacrificing in doing that is that they don't have a predictable business model. They don't, have, um, they don't really have revenues. Um, they're going to likely have further ongoing funding requirements. Yeah. Um, and so you know, what are they going to point to, to public market investors to demonstrate progress? You know, if you encounter a much more difficult funding environment, how are they going to deal with the stresses that come with that? Um, and, and to my mind, it would be easier to deal with some of those things as a private company that will, than it will be to do in, in, the, yeah. in, the, in the glare of public markets. Absolutely. And I think you know, maybe just um, another sort of in the similar field, um, the other company that we had questions come in on um, was on Ginkgo Bioworks, which has obviously been quite high profile um, mm. over the last uh, month or so. And, and James, I know this field of synthetic biology is one that you're you know, immensely excited about um, as well. So how do you view you know, where Ginkgo is in its stage of development versus a, a Joby and Lilium in terms of that ability to, to, to be going public now? Well, I, I, I'm not sure that I put this in this way uh, to Tom and Lawrence, so you may want to see whether they react. But <laughs> I, I, I would couple Ginkgo with Moderna and thereby into mm -hmm. Illumina in that I think outside what we we're previously talking about with renewable energy, what we're seeing is the process of software taking over the world is being applied to new industries that in both these cases really what the leaders of these companies would tell you is that it used to be said that neither pharmaceutical discovery nor biotechnology and synthetic biology could be reduced to code but they can yeah. and it's just a different code and i think that is transforming both those businesses which is incredibly important in and of itself but gives them two characteristics that as investment matters and in many ways separates them off from some of the ones that we've been talking about because on the one hand you've got this process of exponential improvement and that morphs into the margin structure because as with so many digital business it's the amount and pace of growing data yeah. that really really matters so i think one of the frightening elements here is and for assuredly we're further on with the modernas of this world than with the ginkgos but i think it's the same process it may mean that early leadership really locks you in to dominance for years to come in a phenomenon that in a way I think Tom we mentally thought of as more being associated just with the digital internet businesses but I think it may apply to these absolutely critical areas and I think that is different from a North Volta or a Joby or whatever. Yeah I think that's I, I totally agree with that and I think you know the this process of accelerating the development of that code base is 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 one that's really worth investing in and you know, in, in the case of Ginkgo, we had a very frank conversation with the with the with the founder Jason Kelly about um, you know his expectations of this process. We we probably came down and you know from a, a slightly different position on what we thought the ideal path forward w was that, than he did. But I think the clear area of agreement was that 
as you, whether they went through the IPO process or through the SPAC process is the, the aim should be to have that core of long-term owners in the register on a two or three year view. So how do you get to where you are as a private company to a public company with that, that top 10 shareholder list that, that you want that will enable you to run the business in the way you want to? And he had a clear idea of how he wanted to get there and we were happy to back him in, in going down that yeah. route. Okay. And Lawrence, I know that there's a, a, you came out with this great quote uh, a couple of weeks ago, which you said it was, um, was it one of Steve Jobs' final predictions? Was that he said that the, it would be the uh, meeting of biology and, and technology would foster the greatest innovations of, of the 21st century. So I guess Ginkgo is probably um, a company that would, uh, would fall into that category. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it is. And I think the big context is really applying things like Moore's law and data, which have been so transformative in industries like retail and advertising, where we've got the Googles and the Facebooks and the Amazons of this world, and then applying that on a canvas that's much more important, both in size and scale and, and to sort of human outcomes as, as an area like biology and healthcare. And I think that is really driving some quite fundamental excitement because it can go in so many more different directions, I think, and impact people's lives in even more profound ways. And so I think over the next 10, 15, 20 years, trying to understand um, what that means and how that develops is something that's going to take up an awful lot of time. And, and I think the final point would just be, I think what's interesting in picking up on James is if, if we're seeing some of the same patterns of the use of data and an element almost of network effects as well, that might mean the economics look a bit more like the digital business models of the past than the healthcare models of the past. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. But I, I guess despite the, I guess, plethora of SPACs that we've seen, I guess the fact of the matter is that companies are staying private for longer. You know, if we, if we look at all, all the data that would suggest that, you know, cultural norms amongst founders is such that they are wanting to, to, to stay private um, for longer. And maybe Lawrence, I'll maybe come back to you on this. I mean, I think it's sometimes misunderstood, you know, where, where we feature in, in our private companies. You know, we're not doing traditional venture cap, you know, we're, we're not doing private equity as such. You know, what we're really trying to do is provide you know, stage appropriate um, s support. So we did have a number of questions come in, which was how much engagement do you have, you know, with the boards? You know, how much operational um, support do you, do you give companies of private companies? And has that changed as a result of our size and scale? I, I think, see our primary role in the provision of private capital of being genuinely long-term um, patient capital. Yeah. Um, I think there are a number of different venture capitals that tend to get more involved at the board level in operational and day-to-day -day advice. I, I think our differentiation and advantage is that perhaps unlike some of those, we're wanting to invest without any particular stage of exit in mind. Yeah. Um, you know, a number of VCs, once a company goes public, they might sell within one to two years where we would be more than happy to own it for a decade afterwards. And if you look in Scottish Mortgage, you know, we've owned Meituan and Spotify for a number of years while they were private, and we continue to own them today um, very happily. And I think what that gives, and it builds on Tom's point really, is it gives them stability in their shareholder register. They don't have the pressure to create liquidity events um, and, and, and sort of refresh that investor list. And that, I think, becomes particularly important when you're thinking about the next stage of a company and when you want to IPO. And I'd like to think one of our advantages is that we're completely agnostic whether they IPO in a year or two or five years or 10 years. The only thing we really care about is what's best for the long-term business to deliver that outcome for shareholders. So that agnosticism between private and public, I think is quite helpful in the provision of capital in the private space. Absolutely. And then I guess following on from that, James, I know this is something that you um, are, are quite keen to emphasize from a Scottish mortgage perspective is that fact that we, we are agnostic to their status. We benefit from that compounding of returns, you know, because mm -hmm. we're buying these companies at that lower starting value, whether it's a Spotify, HelloFresh, Mutuan, whatever. Do you think that's an underappreciated advantage of Scottish mortgage that we, we really benefit from that long round compounding? Uh, I, I, I do. Um, and, you know, I, I hope you won't be surprised by this, Claire, but, you know, I think we have got a lot further along this and many more lines of thought and much greater access than really we could have believed possible, Tom, when, when, we, when we started in this area. But I, I, I think it's utterly transforming what you can do on that, not just by the mechanical effects of where you are in the share price, and you know, I think one of the very interesting things has been really when Lawrence says we're stage agnostic, what that's come from is 
we want to know whether the process that we believe in can be applied to these companies. Yeah. So they're very rarely are they sort of gadget companies with a dream at, at the start of it. And they, we put them through the same process effectively as elsewhere. But, you know, I don't think I'm any longer quite agnostic. And I think one of the critical elements, and it spins off what Tom was saying for sure, but perhaps put it in a slightly different way, is that I think by and large, the quality of ownership that you have in the private world is far, far better. You know, I, I, I said to somebody yesterday that I think in a way we've had to make, as a, 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 as a society, as an industry, venture capital more important because equity markets are not doing the job they were originally designed for. This is why we do it. But the last point, and it was absolutely brilliantly encapsulated by some of the companies that Lawrence was, was mentioning an example of that. It is the relationships and knowledge that we have when these companies are private that should endure. Yep. Um, Spotify being one that yep. very much comes to my, my, my mind on, on, on that score. And I think that is profoundly important. And if I put all this together, you know, I can't see how in the future capitalism and investment firms can exist without doing yeah. this. You know, it's to me, it is so central that I think it is the driving force of how we should think about the world. You've read the mind of our shareholders here, um, James, because we had a question come in there live saying, do you think even more attention should be paid to this area by the wider fund management industry? And the answer is there. Oh, oh, obviously, totally. Yeah. I, I yeah. talk quite a lot, but, you know, just 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 a sentence on it. I. I think it's going to be very hard for some people to reinvent this in a way yeah. because all those habits of quarterly calls of concern about volatility, etc., that we've gone through are so ingrained in so many fund management institutions that I don't really see that having as great appeal to most yeah. of the visionary owners and founders of these companies. I can imagine. And then just maybe um, moving uh, tact slightly, you'll be, you won't be too surprised that we had uh, a lot of questions come in on, on China, um, particularly around the well-documented um, tensions. So maybe just a broad question to start. Um, Tom, I'll maybe come to you on this, is how confident do you, are you on the outlook for China? Well, I guess the outlook for China is, is so broad a topic as to to en encompass almost anything that, that I wanted to talk about. And I think what I would focus in on is that the companies that we see in China, the entrepreneurship at scale yeah. is getting to the point of almost being unique anywhere in the world. Um, that, that you, ha first of all, you have this huge domestic market opportunity and then cutthroat competition, you know, whenever a new idea or a new model, a, a model emerges. And the companies that emerge from that, that vicious competition in that huge market are battle hardened with, with leaders who can who really have a vision of what they're trying to, to achieve. And generally, generally to win at that sort of scale, they, they have a clear path of where they want to go to next. And so despite the dominance of the giants in Alibaba and Tencent, we've, we've had a new generation of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. coming through that are able to keep innovating and keep scaling. And, and it, that is the, the part of what's going on in China that makes it so attractive to us, um, that, that you see these companies um, and coming through with, with, a, with, with, a, with a, a real drive and vision for where they're going. And whether that's whether that's ByteDance or Meituan or PDD, um, you know, I think I think we've had the launch of Full Truck Alliance IPO this week. There's another private companies that we, that we've backed in China that's that's coming through. Um, but at the same time, the giants are also continuing to, to grow rapidly. I think one of the 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 really underappreciated aspects of of Tencent, for example, is their skills as investors. Yeah. The track record that they've had in, in building this, this portfolio of investments that, that's worth probably around $200 billion, if not more today, yeah. is, is frankly quite astonishing, you know, when they've been at the same time getting on with their day job of, 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 the, of managing this rapidly growing um, um, 
consumer facing empire Absolutely. Um, and so you know, we, you know we can we can talk about the macroeconomics although I'm not sure there's a great deal of value in that we can talk about the political tensions but again these things are very very hard to to to, to make sensible investment judgments about so you bring it back to the, the companies and the entrepreneurship and that's what makes us so bullish about the opportunity there Absolutely. Maybe just following on from that then, Tom, I know um, obviously um, Tencent's now, give or take, the, the largest position um, in, in the trust today. And, and Lawrence, I think it was the beginning of the year or um, early, later last year that you met with Martin Lau of, of Tencent. And it just maybe interesting just to maybe spend a bit of time on how have they navigated the difficult regulatory backdrop um, and how well are they executing in their core business when you compare it to you know the issues at Alibaba and, and, and Ant? Yeah I think the first point would just be that there's always been a regulatory backdrop for them to navigate um, you know it's sort of short memories of, of, of markets you know 2018 they, they came under um, a lot of headlines around gaming regulation um, and licensing yeah. pausing on, on new games and certain restrictions coming on and they, they, you know, they've navigated that and are onto a, a firmer footing again and are as optimistic as ever about the potential for gaming. Um, so, so I think I, I put it in the wider context that this isn't the, the first sort of regulatory challenge a number of these companies have had in China. Um, in terms of how they're navigating it, I think it's, and this would be a general one, I think one, it's an attempt to have a constructive relationship with the government and two, a realization that they have to earn a social license to exist and have to be in some ways moving society forward in terms of their actions. Um, and I think the third thing that particularly applies to Tencent is, and this goes to the point of them being really good investors, is that they've often um, invested in the likes of Meituan and others and helped supported them with their ecosystem and really empowered um, other business models to go and achieve great things, which is, I think both quite a, a sort of thing that's appreciated within society, but also um, I think it's, it's something I quite respect and admire because they've gone and looked at certain large areas where they don't have quite the right expertise, but have backed others in those areas and supported them. And I think that's been very admirable and of course um, created huge amounts of value for their shareholders. Absolutely. And maybe just one last question just to touch on, on China. Maybe James, I'll, I'll ask you this. Is, how much do you think it's made a difference having on the ground research in, in China? I mean, obviously, you've always had, you know, very good relationships, you know, with, with the companies there. But do you feel like there's been a difference from having, you know, our, our own office now in Shanghai and the insights that we're now getting from having that on the ground presence? Oh, absolutely. And as you know, I am I'm not of the view that all our equity investors in Bailey Gifford have really helped contributed that much to that they're sensibly enough getting on with their own tasks but what linda lynn and her partners have done in china has been truly remarkable and i think we are incredibly fortunate that we have someone who absolutely understands what we are trying to do but at the same time can absolutely gain us trust and access from the Chinese companies of that. So, you know, hugely important and a huge kudos to her. I'm sure she'd like to, to, to be here, but it's obviously difficult <laughs> at, the, uh, at, the, at, the, at the moment. Um, I, can I just, a couple of things to add to the yeah. previous part of the group, very briefly. So one of the most vigorous questionings, Claire, that I've received on this topic of isn't China worrying? was at a forum in America in the second week of January, where a uh, concern about Chinese political upheavals was deeply set. Um, you had to sort of delicately remind them that there'd been a coup in America the week before. <laughs> and, you know, I, I have to say, you know, I think there are quite big issues elsewhere for, mm -hmm. from these points of view. Um, and, and, and secondly, can I put it in the context of now we're getting huge amounts of questions of China. It's not that I resent them or any of us resent them at all. I don't think they're serious matters. But let's link back. It feels a bit like the questioning of Tesla or Amazon at various <laughs> phases, and that is what gives you opportunities. You have to make the right judgments, but you also have to endure. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, maybe just um, moving, I guess, a little bit closer to home in, in Europe. I, I thought there was an interesting question that actually came in, which maybe alludes to a widely held belief that's maybe not entirely accurate, which was one shareholder asked, um, what is the rationale for holding Ferrari and Kering 
as they stand out from the other tech names that we hold. Now, you know, I, I wanted to say that we obviously are not a tech fund, you know, per se, but uh, nevertheless, um, I thought Ferrari and Caring, we, we don't often talk about too much, but um, yeah, it'd just be interesting to hear, hear your thoughts on the investment cases and the growth potential for, for those two names. I'll, I'll start on that one. Um, well, I'd, I'd, I'd first link it to the, the conversation about, you know, w what, what enables a company to take decisions on the right time frame. Mm -hmm. And I think in, in both of these instances, mm -hmm. what you have are really, really valuable brands. Yeah. And to develop and um, really maximize the opportunity set that, that, that comes from having those brands, they have to be exploited extremely patiently and developed over very long periods of time. And in both instances, you have family ownership that creates the environment and facilitates that type of decision making. Yep. So, so in these older companies, you, you don't need a founder, but you, but you are looking for another mechanism that unlocks that decision making timeframe. Yep. Um, I think you know, if you go back to the, the genesis of our investment in, in Ferrari, um, you know, it, it was actually pre the de, pre its, pre its demerger. Mm. Um, and it came at a time when there was immense hostility to, to what was going on in continental Europe. And, um, you know, everybody was forecasting the demise of the Euro and, and Forecast, you know, fo focused on these macroeconomic issues and ignoring an asset that uh, we felt was the most valuable brand that existed. Um, and if you, if you then sort of wind the clock forward, it's you know, what, what we see at the company is you know, this, this really thoughtful engagement with the, with the technology and the changing, yeah. uh, the changing picture of technology. You know, it's not head in the sand, you know, we make, you know, um, V8 engine, you know, supercars, but you know, the the brand is associated with technology and being at the cutting edge, etc. And and this again, just really thoughtful way about how you exploit and develop that position. Um, and and caring, um, you know, is there is there is a similar picture, the the you know the way that brand has been managed, you know, the the inspirational creative um, contribution um, that we've seen there, but allied with that with uh, with Monsieur Pino's ma people management and ability to manage that portfolio of brands. Um, and so so we're looking for growth. We're looking for exceptional growth companies, not tech, as you, as you talked about, yeah. you know, exceptional growth. And yeah. and we're also open minded to, to how rapidly the companies exploit that potential. These these are companies will ex which will exploit that that potential over a longer period of time. But we think are, are vastly underappreciated by the market. Yeah. Um, because because of the duration of that growth opportunity. Absolutely. And I guess, Tom, just on that, I mean, you talk about, you know, our desire to find exceptional growth companies. You know, I think you maybe said in an interview at the beginning of the year that you thought AWS might actually be, you know, the most important company in the world. James, you have said this is ASML. <laughs> so, Lawrence, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Um, it's down to you to settle it. But, uh, you know, just in terms of the importance of ASML, just... Um, just be interesting just to hear your thoughts on this because I know it's one that you feel quite strongly about. I think it's it's interesting that we've got a company that isn't sort of top of our headlines that yeah. comes from Eindhoven where few people sort of go or recognize as, as a hub of technology and innovation and I think ASML is is so foundational to the continuation of lots of the elements of change we've been talking about so whether that's healthcare and Moderna whether that's indeed AWS itself or some of the e-commerce companies or what we're seeing in China, it's played an absolutely critical role in allowing the continuation of um, Moore's law through the development of EEV technology. Um, and I think it is a company that is doing some of the hardest things in the world. I mean, it's, academics widely recognize uh, their lithography machines to be the world's most complex machines. You know, they require about two 747 jumbo jets to be transported, cost several hundred million dollars. It's, it's really cutting edge technology that's vital really, I think, for human progress. And so I, I think it's, it's a company that we're, we're very glad to be shareholders of and close to for, apart from anything else, trying as best we can to gather what the roadmap is and the confidence for that continuing in the next decade and beyond. Do you think the implications for you know, you've talked about, you know, the increasing computing power and, you know, if we extrapolate out Moore's law, you know, what, 
what does a 60 times increase in computing power over the next <laughs> you know, decade look like? Do you think people will find that hard to comprehend what the implications are? Um, James, maybe I'll come to you on, on, on that one. Oh, I, I, Claire, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to take that one up. I'm going to pass it back to Lawrence. <laughs> but with, with the, the, the preemption, if I may, if it sounds like Lawrence agrees with me I know, that it's ASML one, is actually the foundation <laughs> of, of this <laughs> AWS, the exploiter. <laughs> um, I was actually trumped by an American fund manager I admire recently who was listening to one of his um, podcasts. He said that actually he thought ASML was responsible for most of human progress over the last 30 years. Um, but on the 60-fold question, Lawrence has honestly done a lot of thinking in, uh, about that, so I think it's fair to pass that back. Yeah, I, I think the honest answer would be that a lot of the thinking has, has been about trying to frame that as the question rather than, than mm. knowing the answer. Um, and I think you know, you've got a Moore's Law, you've got a doubling every 18 to 24 months, you've got ASML saying they've got the roadmap out to 2030 and a little bit beyond. And so with a relatively unusual degree of conviction with this long-standing trend, you can go, well, what does that mean? And over the course of a year or two, it doesn't mean a huge amount. Yeah. But again, it's exponential growth. And that, yeah, if it continues another two years after that 60 fold, it's quite obvious that it's then into the triple digits of impact. And I think, yeah, one of the things that myself and James were talking about not so long ago was the idea that if 30 years ago you'd just gone, what are the implications for Moore's law? Yeah. It would have given you quite a lot of investment answers for where you should spend your time looking for growth and for change and for shareholder returns. And I think, you know, we've been seeing that continue for the next decade. It's, it's the question we've really got to grapple with. And I think, you know, one of those answers is the continuing digitization of our economy, yeah. um, backing people that are doing interesting things and doing unreasonable things as well yeah. is a good place to start. And I think the second is, as we've talked about, seeing that seep through into bigger industries that haven't been as touched by digital technology, where healthcare and biology is, is pretty at the top of that agenda. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think there is it Peter Wenick, he had a, a great quote in a meeting um, you had at the beginning of the year when he said that the only serious competition that ASML is facing is the law of physics, mm. um, which really, I think, just gives you a sense of just their, their sort of competitive um, position. So I'm not sure, Tom, on that basis, am I, is it 3v1 here? or? <laughs> I'm, I, I did think, Claire, that the, your, your question was quite an old fashioned one about what might happen if Moore's law continued for the next decade. <laughs> if, you, if you look at the pace of development of machine learning, um, the, the, cost, the cost declines in training a machine learning model, um, just the scale of the models that are being used, both those trends are progressing far faster than the Moore's law at this point. Okay. Um, and you know, thinking through the implications of, of that, you know, might might be even more interesting. So, take a, take an example from from the portfolio. Um, we own we own shares in a company called Tempus, yeah. and what they are doing is um, solving a huge uh, data problem that exists in the healthcare industry, um, of of actually trying to get a proper catalog of the physiology of of patients' disease but then matching it against um, a, the, the, the um, genomic analysis of their disease. And on the basis of having that full um, understanding of the underlying genetics of, of the illness and the patient's individual circumstances, they're then able to use machine learning on this vast data set and actually start to suggest treatment pathways based on all the available data in the way that an individual physician just would simply be unable to do. Um, now that's already leading to better outcomes for patients. You know, it can identify relevant clinical trials for that individual. It can look at the history of individuals with, with exactly the same physiology and see what outcome, what, what treatments have, had led to the best outcomes. But, but imagine what they're going to be able to do 10 years from now with the, with the pace of progress in this technology. I think I think I think it'll leave Moore's law looking very pedestrian on that time scale. <laughs> it, it, it is presumably, in some ways, dependent on Moore's law. But I think you know the Tempest one is so interesting, isn't it? That I think it may be, it may be worth a little bit more about that. So I think those underlying trends that Tom is talking about there are, are incredibly appealing, exciting, etc. And it always interested me that John Kay, our ex-director, who, you know, obviously we benefited hugely from his thoughts experience, but John wasn't by and large an optimist. Um, but yet I remember 
very clearly, when we first started getting very excited about this, he looked at me and said, well, of course Moore's Law and associated technologies will start to affect healthcare. It was just a matter of time. Yeah. And so I think you've got that inevitability. But the part that you know, I think is truly intriguing here, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to offer an answer, but you know, why was it, Tom, that it was Tempest that appears to have got to have a lead in this area? Because you know, this was a recognised nirvana for many companies, many companies with a stronger starting point, whether in capital or, or, or scale. Um, so you know, it's it's adding to those exponential trends. Can you identify the teams, the cultures, the companies, the founders that are going to really be the winners in those areas? That I think is 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 the most exciting challenge of all. Absolutely. I promise we would leave some time for um, live questions and they have been coming in thick and fast as we've been talking. Um, so let's just jump right to them. Maybe Lawrence, I will start um, one for you, which is somebody's asked, there's huge parts of the world that are not represented um, in the portfolio. So India and um, Japan, very little in, in Latin America. Why is this? Is it the fact that the companies do not meet to your criteria or is it something more structural? It's the question from Sarah Whitley. <laughs> well, I, I, it's been, the name's been taken off it, James, so we'll, <laughs> I'll ask you afterwards. So, so I think in some ways I'd link this firstly um, back that there are sort of hubs of innovation where I think we're doing great deals of learning and China is, is one of those in terms of business models with other companies and countries taking inspiration. The second would be we have an indirect exposure to some of the countries mentioned. I mean, Amazon's operations in India are, are quite significant, um, as indeed there's a growing presence by some of the Chinese companies that win those markets as well. Um, and then I think we've got Latin America, we own Mercado Libre, which we don't own much. It's the only company we own in Latin America, but I think it is probably by far the most significant because they're building out the infrastructure for retail with e-commerce, but also the infrastructure for finance where they're broadening access to financial services that didn't exist before. And, and then I think you know, it, it's right that we need to start thinking about other parts of the world and making sure we're building up our domain knowledge so that as the right business models emerge, you know, we can invest in them. So I've spent a lot of time over the last few years on the ground in India. Um, my trip before uh, the COVID was supposed to be to sub-Saharan Africa. So I think there are definitely areas that we're looking at and trying to make sure we build our networks and domain knowledge so that we can um, really apply it when the business models apply. So we have a number of investments there that will link, but I suspect that they'll grow over time. You know, HDFC in India would be another one as well. Of course, yeah. Um, and then it'll come as, as no surprise this, this next topic, I guess. Um, Tom, maybe I'll, I'll put this one your your direction. So Scottish Mortgage recently invested in blockchain. Bitcoin clearly divides opinion, as we know, particularly on ESG grounds. Could the managers please share their thinking on this? I think what is fascinating about um, Bitcoin is and, and, and the associated technologies is the idea of digital scarcity which is something that we haven't had hitherto. And I think there are all sorts of um, interesting applications that follow from that. Um, it's a technology which is still extremely young, um, but, the, but the, the barometer for me is, can you find companies run by really interesting entrepreneurs that are driving forward that vision and, and building out that opportunity? And where you find them, you, you back them and you try to learn from them about that evolving position. Um, and so you know, this, this is an area that, that we focused on. Um, um, the, the, the investment in, in blockchain.com is, um, is, is a, a small toehold in this area. Hopefully there will be more opportunities because there are a lot of interesting people, interesting venture capitalists in, investing into it. Absolutely. And uh, maybe um, just worth re-emphasizing the point, we're not investing in Bitcoin, Bitcoin the asset class yes. at this point. It's it's companies that operate within that ecosystem. Yeah, it's the financial infrastructure. Um, James, somebody 
picked up on the fact that you obviously mentioned the UK and, and uh, the, the innovative backdrop in the UK. Um, it was obviously announced this morning that WISE, or mm. probably known as TransferWISE, um, is about to IPO. Um, somebody's asked, could the managers outline the investment case and how the listing might impact the company? I'm not sure who would like to, to take that one. Sure. Um, I mean, we, we, we could all add elements of this. But I, I think it is a very interesting example of the pluses and minuses in, 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 in the UK. There is this plethora of at least to some extent UK based uh, fintech companies. But the challenge so far has been, as is the challenge of so many British companies, to scale that into global and genuinely significant levels. And for us, the most important sing single feature of today's announcement is, and obviously we talked to the company about this, that they are determined to have differential voting rights, at least for a period of time. And to our mind, when you have a shareholder base that is perennially impatient, that becomes even more important to establish in Britain than elsewhere. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we need to stand up for that absolutely. And I'm sure there will be lots of critiques in the media over the next few days on that topic. Um, and we want to support the company in that. Um, I think it's a fantastic service. Um, it's, it's a good it helps service, me it? greatly. <laughs> I should be able to get shares as a, as a customer as well as, <laughs> well as, as our ownership. Um, but, you know, they are grasping the possibility of yeah. making this global scale business. And that's what we've got to anchor on trying to help. Absolutely. And maybe just um, in the interest of time, a final one here, which is maybe a good one to finish on, which is somebody has asked the managers like big winners in huge and growing markets. What is the next trillion dollar industry that does not already exist? Tom, I'll come to you first, put you on the spot. I think um, talking about industries that don't exist is, is, has not really been the way that we have, have approached this. Yeah. It's more been looking at opportun opp opportunities, ways of doing things that um, are becoming obsolete in the face of new approaches and new technologies. And so you know, we've, we've touched on healthcare. You know, I, I think they're, they're this, this intersection of, of information technology and healthcare is is a is a trillion dollar opportunity yep. um you know we, we we haven't talked about a great many of them but the 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 move towards clean and abundant energy yep. combined with the electrification of the transport sector i i think creates a whole other trillion dollar opportunity um and and you, we could we could go on because there's a number of these areas where you are just seeing these transformational changes but you've got to ally that from an investment standpoint it's not sufficient to say, you know, is it a big opportunity? Yeah. But is there a company with a business model, a approach, a culture that is hard for others to emulate? Because if you don't have that, then, you know, you don't get super normal returns and you don't get, you know, the exceptional businesses that, that we invest in. So you can see plenty of changes yeah. or, or new opportunities without being, being able to make returns. Yeah. So you, I think you have to bring it back to that individual entrepreneur company level. Lawrence, James, anything final to add on, on that point? I think it'd probably go back to what SM's done in the private areas. We talked about sort of the opportunities and supporting companies, but I also think it's a great way to build one's knowledge um, because a lot of these companies that we're talking about as being the next generation in healthcare or energy, they're in the private space. And it's through investing in them and engaging with the management teams that we're able to better understand sort of what are the possible trajectories for the future. And that has huge implications, not just for the companies themselves, but also our existing public holdings. And so I, I think it's that ability to have those, uh, again, connections in both public and private that are very helpful in building a view of where to look for the next big industries or, or as Tom really rightly said, the next uh, founders and business models of the future. Yep. Oh, I, I think the process of change will accelerating, accelerate, the scale of change will accelerate. 
Um, and you know, I, I couldn't be happier that my colleague successors will have all these opportunities and I'm sure they will do a fantastic job in pursuing them. So I can leave it at that. Great. Well, I guess on, on that note and in the interests of, of time, unfortunately, we have to uh, wrap it up there. Um, apologies if we did not get through um, all the questions. There was a huge amount submitted, as you can imagine. Um, if there is anything you'd like us to follow up on, then please do get in touch with your Bailey Gifford contact and we will endeavour to come back to you. So all that remains is for me to thank James, Lawrence and Tom for what's been a fascinating discussion. And thank you very much um, at home for watching. Um, a very good afternoon to you all.